One of the most popular comic strips of all time, it connected with readers on a deeply emotional level. Its depiction of an idealized childhood combined with unfettered imagination was relatable, even if the nostalgia it evoked was for a time and place that never existed. Beloved but universally misunderstood, for in a world that rewards success with fame and fortune, artistic integrity can be an unforgivable act of rebellion. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Calvin and Hobbes. Thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Go to CuriosityStream.com slash Galaxy Media to save 25% right now. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of nonfiction movies and shows from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. CuriosityStream has millions of subscribers and new shows every week on history, science, tech, military history, and more. It's also extremely affordable at under $20 a year. Curiosity Stream is about being curious. It's in the name, and they cover the entire spectrum of things you might want to know more about. Do you like asteroids, comets, and meteors? Then watch Asteroids, Comets, and Meteors. Want to know more about the future of engineering? Then watch Engineering the Future. Do you like fiddling? Then watch Fiddlin'. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms. It's the world's first streaming service addressing our lifelong quest to learn, to explore, and most importantly, to understand. Click the link below or go to curiositystream.com slash galaxymedia and save 25% right now. That's only $14.99 for the whole year. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash galaxymedia. And thank you again to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. Calvin and Hobbes is a comic strip created by Bill Watterson that ran from November 18, 1985 to December 31st, 1995. Many consider it to be the pinnacle of the art form, a strip that pushed the limits of what newspaper comic strips could be, setting a standard that absolutely no one could or would choose to follow. Calvin and Hobbes is about a six-year-old boy and his best friend, a stuffed tiger doll that, to him, is as real as anyone else in the world. And maybe the rest of the world would realize that if only they could see Hobbes the way Calvin does. From wagon rides to exploring the woods to tree forts to best efforts to gross out Susie Durkins, the girl next door, Calvin and Hobbes are living their best lives. The strip draws its humor, its sentimentality from Calvin's observations of the world around him. His parents, his teachers, his babysitter, a bigger kid at school named Mo that bullies him, and whatever the disgusting green slime is that his mom made for dinner. All of it paints the picture of a world of innocence, discovery, and once-in-a-lifetime adventure. Calvin and Hobbes was created by Bill Watterson. He lived in Washington, D.C., where his mother was a city councilwoman, his father a patent attorney. Along with his brother, they moved to Chagrin Falls, Ohio when Watterson was six, the same age as Calvin in the comics. Watterson spent a lot of time drawing and reading comics as a kid. He was creative, but not overzealous the way Calvin is. Watterson insists that while his comics are inspired by his youth, they are by no means autobiographical. Watterson honed his artistic skills through high school. He graduated from Kenyon College in Ohio, not far from Chagrin Falls. With a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science, he set his sights on becoming a political cartoonist. Watterson admired local political cartoonist Jim Borgman, who graduated from the same college four years earlier, whose work was featured in the Cincinnati Enquirer. Borgman took Watterson under his wing to help him develop his own work. Whether it was genuine talent on Borgman's part or lack thereof on Watterson's, Bill struggled doing anything that even remotely approached the level of wit and craft that Borgman's work exhibited. That pressure to perform was compounded by the fact that Watterson was hired by the rival Crosstown newspaper, the Cincinnati Post. Watterson's job as a political cartoonist was on a trial basis or at will, meaning that he could quit at any time without giving notice, or the Cincinnati Post could fire him without any notice. Turns out he wasn't very knowledgeable about local politics and his work paled in comparison to Borgman, but before his six-month contract ended, Watterson was fired. Jim Borgman would go on to be a nationally syndicated political cartoonist, winning a Pulitzer Prize in 1991. In 1997, he co-created and illustrated the strip Zitz, which is still being produced today. Watterson applied for other editorial cartooning positions, but found himself instead working for a small design company that made ads for local grocery stores. For the next five years, his days were spent enticing shoppers to take advantage of a sale on chicken cutlets, while his nights were devoted to developing a strip that a syndicate might buy. For five years, Watterson developed characters and concepts, wrote hundreds of 
three panel punchlines, submitted dozens of ideas that were all rejected, each rejection forcing him to put the pieces in a different order, trying to break the code as to what the editors were looking for, and what worked best for him as an artist and writer. It was United Features that noticed a supporting character in one of those submissions, the younger brother who carried a stuffed tiger. That, they suggested, was where he should build from. That had marketing potential, and that was what they were really interested in. Merchandising. Watterson took the advice and got to work. The boy was named Calvin the Tiger Hobbs, names derived from the works of philosophers he had studied while in school. As Watterson described them, John Calvin, a 16th century theologian who believed in predestination, Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century philosopher with a dim view of human nature. After re-presenting the idea to United Features, they passed, because they had a different idea about marketing the strip. United was trying to push a new brand character called Robot Man, created by British pop singer, songwriter, industry executive Peter Shelley. The idea was to bring Robot Man to life through a multimedia blitz. Like Garfield, they wanted the whole slate. Comics, music, videos, movies, cartoons, plush toys, clothing. United thought maybe Watterson could be the cartoonist to make that happen. Watterson declined. It went against everything he believed in as an artist, not just the blatantly superficial commercial motivations, but the idea that he would be forced to incorporate someone else's creation into his world, his stories, merely to generate sales of toys and greeting cards and underpants. Saying no was a risk. There was no guarantee that Calvin and Hobbes could stand on its own. Watterson and the Strip were still an unproven entity. Watterson knew that United might be his only option, and the idea of another year of designing coupons for three packs of fish sticks did not excite him. United ultimately hired Jim Medic to write and illustrate Robot Man, which began in February of 1985 and is still running today, having been retitled Monty, since Robot Man is no longer a part of the Strip. Fortunately, United wasn't the only syndicate. Universal Press picked up Calvin and Hobbes, and the first strip was published November 18, 1985, in 35 papers. By 1986, it was running in nearly 10 times as many, and it was being circulated internationally as well. Calvin and Hobbes wasn't just funny. It was at times insightful, reflective, poignant, the supporting characters familiar but unique, Calvin's parents, like so many parents, just trying to get through the day without anyone going to the hospital, dealing with a kid who sometimes seemed like he was trying to get into one. Calvin's parents are never named for good reason. The intent was for Calvin and Hobbes to be a story told through the eyes and experiences of this six-year-old kid. Mom and dad are all he would need. The most important relationship is between the title characters. Calvin has a lot of ideas about life and how it all affects him. He is the center of his universe. Calvin lives in the moment. Hobbes is, most of the time, a willing accomplice in Calvin's schemes and adventures, a measured conservative voice that isn't there to say no to Calvin, but to lobby that equal time be given to self-preservation. The question that Watterson played with over the years was whether Calvin and Hobbes was a Toy Story type of world, where Hobbes literally came to life when no one else was around, or if he was merely imagined to be real through Calvin's unbroken childhood heart. For readers, Hobbes was as real as Calvin. I can tell you fried chicken. Let's go in. Wow, look, Dad, it's Robot Man. Yes, honey, anything you say. May I please have a family bucket, large fry? You can collect Robot Man glasses for your children. 50 cents with any chicken purchase. A different glass each week in April. Don't forget your glass, honey. Wow, wait till my friends see this. 50 cents with any chicken purchase while quantities last. Within a year of its debut, Calvin and Hobbes started winning awards. In 1986, it won the Rubin Award from the National Cartoonists Society. It won again in 1988. Calvin and Hobbes had quickly become one of the most popular comic strips. Bill Watterson had quickly become one of the most popular cartoonists. In the U.S., it is virtually impossible to create something so popular and not become a celebrity, even in the days before YouTube and TikTok. With that celebrity comes the opportunity to become wealthy, capitalizing on the swell of demand for whatever it is you're making. This was the absolute last thing that Bill Watterson wanted. He wanted to be a comic artist first, last, and everything in between. He wanted the focus on the art, the characters, the fantasy. 
While he was paid well for his comics, he wasn't interested in getting rich by the average person's standards. Creative freedom on the page and personal freedom in his day-to-day -day life were far more valuable. From the very beginning, from United's suggestion that Robot Man be added to his comics, Watterson had to fight for control. While Universal had a better understanding of Watterson's desire for control, that didn't stop them from pressuring him to take advantage of the additional revenue streams. Technically, Universal owned all of the rights to the strip. If they had really wanted to, they could have forced the issue. They could have insisted that the shelves be full of Hobbes plush toys, Calvin Halloween costumes, action figures, posters, school supplies, video games. Watterson refused. He didn't want cartoons. He didn't want a movie. No board games. No cereal boxes. The strip was the thing. The characters and the need to be the singular voice telling their stories were too important to him. The grind of having to say no day after day, year after year, wore him down, but never beat him. In 1991, Watterson was able to sign a new contract with Universal, giving him the rights to the comic and any licensing that would come from it. He used his newfound power to double down on his art, focusing the entirety of the spotlight on Calvin and Hobbes. But first, Watterson moved to New Mexico, stopped doing any kind of interviews or media, deliberately vanishing into the background, withdrawing as a public entity. He didn't even show up to collect awards he won. The fight against the syndicate, against the principal driving forces of American pop culture and expectations of society for so many years, prioritizing the integrity of his art over the powers of commercialism, had exhausted him. Watterson, in a step that few in the field of comics could afford to take, gave himself a break. Mental, physical, emotional, artistic. From May 5th, 1991 to February 1st, 1992. While he was away, Universal published reruns but continued to charge papers full price. Watterson loved comics as an art form. He was acutely aware that over the decades, the comics section was getting smaller. Not just in the number of pages the papers would devote, but the size the strips were being printed at. Two years after his first break, Watterson took a second, from April 3rd, 1994 to December 31st, 1994. Once again returning with renewed artistic devotion, this time was different though. This time he decided was going to bring the strip to its conclusion. Through Universal, he notified all of the editors of his intentions, specifically citing that he had achieved everything he had ever wanted to with Calvin and Hobbes. He told their story and was looking forward to a future where he could work on whatever projects he wanted to without deadlines or restrictions. Calvin and Hobbes has been collected into several books and several collections over the years. 18 different volumes were released from 1987 to 1997, collecting the entire run of the newspaper strip, dailies, and Sundays. In October of 2005, Andrews McMeal released a complete collection, three hardcover books, 1,440 pages total, a bunch of bonus material including some history of the strip by Watterson himself. In November of 2012, it was re-released in paperback. By Watterson's design, there is not a lot of Calvin and Hobbes merchandise, collected books, promotional posters for bookstores, two calendars 1988-89 and 1989-90, to a 1990 t-shirt produced for the Museum of Modern Art. Other than a book called Teaching with Calvin and Hobbes that describes how one teacher used the comics in her classroom that was limited to 2,500 copies, there are no other officially licensed examples of Calvin and Hobbes merchandise. It is estimated that Watterson's dedication to his art and the world of Calvin and Hobbes cost him and Universal conservatively 300 to 400 million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Likely more than that if he decided to continue the strip beyond 1995. Calvin and Hobbes could have easily become the next Peanuts or Garfield, constantly being reintroduced to new markets, new generations of fans as the decades wore on. Watterson's concern that licensed plush toys of Hobbes might break the illusion of his existence in the strip was too much for him to compromise. And to their credit, Universal supported him, understanding that, as Watterson had always intended, the art and the artist were inseparable. If they lost Watterson, they would lose Calvin and Hobbes. That Calvin peeing sticker is fake, and every iteration of it. Calvin drinking, Calvin pooping, Calvin farting, Calvin fishing, Calvin praying, Calvin flipping the bird, Calvin picking his nose, Calvin peeing on himself. Wherever there's a void in the marketplace, you can bet the marketplace will find a way to provide. The unlicensed window stickers have been a boon to anyone with a custom vinyl cutting machine for the last 20 years. The emergence of the internet and print on demand made it exponentially worse. Shirts, hats, magnets, pins, virtually all of it infringing on Watterson's ownership of the property and his creative vision for it. Even the stuff that says vintage on eBay, even this tiger that I bought at Target. <laughs> Nailed it. 
For years, Watterson tried to fight back through the law, but even he has given up at this point, saying, I clearly miscalculated how popular it would be to show Calvin urinating on a Ford logo. Long after the strip is forgotten, that is my ticket to immortality. Watterson's choice to end Calvin and Hobbes in 1995 became an extended absence not only from celebrity, but also from sharing his art, which, as a fan, felt like a selfish move on his part, despite the fact that he owed me absolutely nothing, which is a selfish move on my part. The first piece Watterson shared with the public was a painting he did for an auction to benefit Parkinson's research. Richard Thompson, creator of the comic strip Cul-de-Sac, announced in 2009 that he had Parkinson's. In 2011, he established a fundraising effort that included donated art from over 100 cartoonists. Bill Watterson was a fan and friend of Thompson. He donated a 6 by 8 inch oil on board painting of Petey Otterloop, the main character of Cul-de-Sac, that sold for over $13,000. In 2014, Dave Kellett, a cartoonist himself, co-produced and directed a documentary about comics called Stripped, Watterson agreed to not only a phone interview for the documentary, but subsequently agreed to illustrate a poster for the film. That same year, Watterson's art turned up in the panels of the comic strip Pearls Before Swine, normally written and illustrated entirely by Stephen Pastis since 2001. Watterson, who never stopped reading comics, thought it would be fun to ghost some art to, once again, benefit the Parkinson's charitable effort established by Richard Thompson. Watterson's original art is incredibly rare. His inflexibility regarding licensing means that anytime something comes to market, it brings a huge price. Most of Watterson's originals are now housed at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum at The Ohio State University. They have featured his work in special exhibits in the past and are likely to do so again in the future. Fans who were there when the strip first ran and the fans who have found it after it ended have had a hard time letting go. They've spent a lot of time imagining what happened to Calvin and Hobbes, where they went, what they did, who they became. In 2011, Dan and Tom Hireman created an homage called Hobbs and Bacon, operating under the premise that Calvin and Susie got married, had a kid whom they named after the 16th century English philosopher Sir Francis Bacon. Only four strips long, it was clearly crafted with love and admiration for Watterson and the world he created. The documentary Dear Mr. Watterson was released in 2013, directed by Joel Allen Schroeder. It takes a deep dive into Watterson's influence on pop culture, writers, artists, cartoonists, and more, examining what Calvin and Hobbes meant to them while it was active and after it ended. In 2015, Martine Levitt published a short novel called Calvin, which imagines an adult Calvin being diagnosed with schizophrenia, beginning a quest with Susie to find Bill Watterson, hoping that he can cure him of the voices in his head, one of whom is a tiger named Hobbes. The most significant significant homage is the occasional inclusion of Hobbes himself by Berkeley Brethid in his comic Bloom County from 2016 through 2021. While Hobbes looks like he was drawn by Watterson, no one knows for sure if he was drawing it like he did with the Pearls Before Swine strips. Watterson and Brethid have been friends for a very long time and over the years exchanged letters that included original art, some of which Brethid shared with the audience at San Diego Comic-Con in 2010. So it is not entirely impossible, but is it? Canon. Plausible, but at this time, unconfirmed. Stay tuned, updates as they happen. Despite the battles Watterson fought for legitimacy of the artists and the art form, no one followed his lead. Not the way he did it. And ultimately, it didn't matter. In 2022, the real estate of the newspaper page is irrelevant. Watterson got out while the market was changing, but not to the degree it has changed since. The World Wide Web means that anyone can make their comics however they want and retain full ownership. The old systems are gone, the old battles are over. Watterson's dedication to his characters, to the consistency and beauty for the entirety of the 10-year run was as much a blessing as a curse. His decision to end it when he did, how he did, hurt so much because so many people wanted it to continue and assumed it would continue. That was the expectation based on every other beloved and popular strip. A readership conditioned that these things would last forever. The last thing any reader wanted was to have to once again experience the heartbreak of growing up and leaving those beautiful carefree summer days behind again. Calvin and Hobbes was a window back to that time, our shared misremembering of the past, of growing up, of a world still bright and open to exploration, to adventure, a zest for life unbroken by the passing of time and the compounding of heartbreaks. Unironically, it was Watterson's ending the strip that made the most poignant statement about life and the impermanence of things. Calvin couldn't stay six years old forever. Ten years was long enough. Watterson told all the stories he had about that six-year-old boy and his stuffed tiger. At some point, Calvin would have to grow up, or change. But Watterson didn't want us to know him any other way, because to compromise that would be to compromise what he loved about Calvin and Hobbes. That was terrible. <laughs> that was awful. You ever thrown a tiger before? <laughs>
the hell? <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Uh, check us out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy if you're in the position to help the channel grow. If you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below what Calvin and Hobbes means to you, when you found it, how you found it, even if it's through this video right now. I didn't start reading it until at least the first collection came out, but I was hooked from that point on. I know it's not what he would have wanted. It feels wrong, but I'm positive that strip is the reason this tiger exists. It's certainly the reason I own it. Bill Watterson, if you're watching, come try and take it. <laughs> <laughs>